welcome everyone to the quantum field theory course from the IFT, uh, Instituto de Física Teórica of UNESP. Uh, my name is Ricardo Mateus and I'll be teaching during this course. First of all, I apologize for the unprofessional setup, but we have to stay at home and it is what it is. I hope that the um, physical content will make up for it. So let me start with some practical info, uh, information, right? So um, here, uh, so the website for the course will be this one. I'll post the link uh, in the comments of the video below. And all you have to do is go to my website and click courses and then TQC1, uh, which is quantum field theory in Portuguese. Most of the the course in Portuguese, most of the information there is in Portuguese, but I guess anyone can understand uh, links to the the bibliography uh, and additional material that will post there. Eventually I'll convert this to English, but in the past I have given this course only in Portuguese, so that's how it is right now. Uh, for the students that are actually taking the course, right? if you have any doubts during the video, please take note of the timestamp uh, of the video where I said something you didn't understand and we'll have FaceTime twice a week to discuss it. So you can ask questions, you can talk to me about and we'll clarify any any information that was not clear enough in the video. right? Also, uh, in terms of prerequisites, right? Uh, what you, do you need to know uh, in order to understand and uh, follow this course properly, right? So first of all, all is quantum mechanics, right? Preferably at a graduate level course of quantum mechanics is needed to understand what is here, right? You, you need a solid base in quantum mechanics because we will be taking it to uh, applying quantum mechanics in, 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 in systems that are more advanced and more difficult than what you normally see in, in quantum mechanics. Also, you need a solid background in special relativity, not general relativity, uh, but we'll be, because we're not dealing with curved space-times in this course, but special relativity will be everywhere. As you see, that's the two subjects, right? Quantum mechanics and special relativity are the two subjects that we're trying to put together here uh, um, in order to build quantum field theory. I'll define what that is in, in a second. And third, you also need to know classical field theory. right? So uh, at, le at least know how to get uh, equations of motions for fields from a Lagrangian formulation, Lagrangian density, and, and, and so on. Uh, a good solid, co uh, solid course in, in electrodynamics, electromagnetism could could replace a, a specific course in classical field theory, but you need one or the other, right? You need to to know how to deal with um, classical fields. So I think that's that's all for the practical part. Let's get down to the subject itself. So what are we talking about in this course? Right? What is the main objective? Of our course. The aim is to es essentially extend classical mechanics, right? But extend where? Where, where do we want to go? Right? One of the directions we could go is into the microscopic. Right? Essentially what you're doing is making the action, action of your system smaller. When you get to actions which are of the order of h bar, then you're leaving the realm of classical mechanics and you're going into the realm of quantum mechanics. Quantum mechanics. Right? And so that's one direction we could go where classical mechanics is not valid anymore and you need an extension, which is quantum mechanics. Another direction that you could go is to higher energies, right? Or higher speeds. In that direction, what you're doing is you're making velocities or energies bigger, right? And you're getting velocities which are close to the speed of light. When you get to that regime, again, you're leaving classical mechanics and you're going into uh, 
special relativity, right? Special relativity, and and this is uh, the theory you're supposed to use when you're doing with uh, things move, moving close to the speed of light, right? Which is a more general thing than classical mechanics, right? Essentially, you can go back to classical mechanics from either of those by making the action much bigger than the h bar or the speed much smaller than the speed of light. Uh, now, what we would really like to do, and this is coming from the perspective of a particle physicist, right? And the, which is the one of the places where it's, it's the main place where quantum field theory was developed, right? Was to get a combination of these two. Right? Essentially, what you want is to go somewhere here, right? Which you get by doing these two uh, limits at the same time. And the first try in that uh, direction was what was called relativistic quantum mechanics. Mechanics. Right, so that's the first thing people tried um, when trying to to combine these two limits. Right, and the first question that we want to answer today, right, is the main thing we'll look into today is. Uh, the question of does relativistic quantum mechanics uh, work? Right? Does does it work? Right? And well, we'll see. It is important to keep in mind that uh, these will be a quick review on, on relativistic uh, quantum mechanics. Right? If you have never seen this before. You probably will want to go to to a, a introductory book on this and, and and work out the solutions to the equations I'm about to show, right? Namely, Klein-Gordon and Dirac equations. I'll go, I'll show a little bit how you get to these equations, and point out characteristics of of their solutions. But I, I, I'm, I'm doing that very quickly. So if you've never seen this before, you probably want to check that out before uh, going forward. So what do we know? In classical mechanics, you describe the system by a set of coordinates, generalized coordinates. It doesn't need to be position. Uh, and so these are the QI coordinates, right? And conjugate conjugate momenta to these coordinates, right? Once you know uh, these pairs in the Hamiltonian version of classical mechanics, then you only need the Hamiltonian of the system, which will control dictate the time evolution of these coordinates and the conjugate momenta. So essentially, if you know some initial condition for the system, the Hamiltonian will allow you to know. Uh, the coordinates and their momenta in any point of time afterwards, right? You know the evolution of the system. Right? To quantize is a prescription, is an algorithm on how to obtain a quantum system from from this classical mechanics system. Right? What is to what is quantization? Right? Essentially, what you do is you exchange these uh, coordinates by operators. You make the coordinates and the conjugate momenta into operators uh, by imposing um, commutation relations. Right? So you're imposing these conditions. Right? You're imposing that now I'm using hat to indicate these guys are operators. And you're saying that coordinates And um, momenta uh, commute with each other, 
right? But a coordinate and its um, momenta, right? Do not commute with each other, and they have a commutation relation, which is this one, right? Uh, keeping in mind that now I'm using here, I'll, and I'll be using during the whole course natural units, which mean for me c is equal to h bar, which is equal to one. If this is sounds too crazy for you, this is this are called the natural units, very popular among theorists. Um, I'm posting in my website a, a good article written by Jaffe for his MIT course, which it goes deeply into these natural units and why it's it's perfectly fine to do this. Right? The co the consequence of this is that all my units will be in units. Uh, there there will be only one uh, unit really, which is we mostly we use GeV electron. Uh, Giga electron volt, but um, or to some power, right? So giga electron volt, giga electron volt to the minus one or something like that. So if you don't know anything about natural units, I I please go and read this Yaf uh, uh, text. I I'm linking in the in the website. Uh, so when you do that, going back to quantum mechanics, when you make these coordinates and conjugate momenta into operators, right, you need something else to describe the states. And the states will be now uh, vectors in Hilbert space, which is the space where these operators act. So you have to choose one of the operators, build the basis uh, of eigenvectors of this operator, and see how the other operators act on this basis, right? We need to choose a representation, for instance. So if we represent uh, the vectors in Hilbert space by wave functions of like psi of x and t, so there are wave functions that depend on the position and time, right? this is a uh, um, eigenvector of the position operator. So the position operator will be simply this, right? But the momenta uh, operators will take the form of derivatives, hmm? and the Hamiltonian operator itself will be a time derivative. Right? This is for the wave function of one particle. So there's two important things to notice here. Right? First, I'm describing one particle. Right, that has a particular wave function, but no matter what I do to this wave function, how long I let it evolve, every time I do a measurement, I will measure just one particle. Right, and the second thing is the role of time here. Right, time is not an operator. Time is not an observable. Right, the observables are always associated with operator. For each operator, you have an observable because the eigenvalues of that operator are the possible measurements for that observable. Time is not an observable here, it's not an operator, right? It's essentially a parameter, right, that gives the evolution of the system. As I change this number, time, I change uh, the state of the system and thus the, the, the chances of observing one, uh, one eigenvalue or another, right? So, but position is an operator, and that's a very different role for time and position and space, hmm? which already indicates that there will change will be needed if we want to make construct something like a space time, where space and time are on a more uh, equal footing. Hmm? Then, when, if we do that, we can write an equation for the evolution of this wave function. Again, departing from the classical Hamiltonian, I'm thinking just of a free particle here, right? So the, the free 
particle or Hamiltonian is just a kinetic energy. Right? If I use this prescription, I can exchange the Hamiltonian op uh, function by the Hamiltonian operator acting on this wave function and write it like this. Right? Now both the Hamiltonian and the momenta are operators acting on the wave function. And if I substitute this in this equation, right, then I get Schrodinger's equation. This is the mass of the particle, sorry. Again, you see the difference between uh, space and time. I have two derivatives in the position and only one derivative in time, which is a bad sign if one to make this uh, relativistic. But okay, let's roll it and see what we can get from, from this. Hmm? So, what is this wave function good for? Right? Uh, it gives the probability density more specifically, right, the, 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 the chance I find the particle anywhere is given by the modulus square of this wave function. Hmm? And if I um, take uh, this equation and multiply it by itself, or by the complex conjugate of this equation, I can easily write the following equation for rho, for the probability density. If I combine those two, I get that the derivative of this uh, probability the pro density, the probability density, is related to this flux Like this, so the the variation of uh, the density, uh, the probability density, is related to this uh, flux. Where I this is defined, this current, right, is defined like i over two m psi star derivative of psi minus psi derivatives of psi star. Hmm? So we, we have these two equations. And this is what we call a continuity equation. Right? So this one right here is what we call a continuity equation. So why? Right? If you, you could, in principle, uh, integrate over a certain volume in, in position, right? In integrate over x, y, and z, and you could rewrite this second term as uh, integral over a surface around this region, and then j would be the flux of probability across this surface. And what this equation is telling me, it is telling us, is the variation of the total amount of rho inside this, this region plus whatever is flowing is, is equal to zero. So this is a conserved quantity, right? Which is the density probability uh, for me to find the particle, right? And this, uh, the consequence of this equation is that rho is conserved. Right? And also, by definition, since this is the square, I mean the modulus square of a complex number, this is a positive. So the probability is always positive and it's conserved, right? uh, which are things you expect uh, of probabilities. <laughs> uh, now, 
the main question we want to to address essentially when you're trying to build a relativistic uh, version of 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 this is what happens if we do the same for the relativistic Hamiltonian, right? What happens if I try to follow the same prescription I, I use here? I, I write them, I wrote a classical free particle Hamiltonian and I substituted momenta and Hamiltonian by operators, right? To get an equation for rho. Can I do the same with the relativistic? Uh, Hamiltonian. Uh, so that is the question. Let's try to do that. Mm -hmm. um, so let's try to do the re relativistic version of the same uh, prescription. Mm -hmm. Let's see what happens. So in, in the case of relativity, the Hamiltonian of a free particle is actually given by p squared plus m squared. Again, c is 1, that's why there's no c to the 4 here. Powers of c missing everywhere, because c is 1. And now, I will substitute both the Hamiltonian and the momenta for operators, which leads me to this equation. Now the Hamiltonian is squared, so you have second derivatives in time, which is one of the things you would want, right? I have pointed out that in the previous case you have different uh, number of derivatives for space and time, which is not good. Now we do have the same number of derivatives, right? and of course mass is just mass, I'll keep it here. And um, you get to this equation. Now this is the equation for your wave function. I can make this even more compact by by using a definition. Um, uh, I can just write this box operator defined like this and then my equation becomes a little bit simpler because I can put time and space derivatives together to get this equation which is the famous Klein Gordon equation. Hmm? And I know the solutions to this equation. Hmm? Anyone that took a course in classical field theory has seen this. Uh, and uh, the solutions are wave functions of the form and n is just some normalization e to the i p x minus e i e t hmm? where e is the energy defined as for the relativistic dispersion relation Yeah, which I started with. So E is just the eigenvalue of H. Now I have the second time derivative, right? which I wanted. But there is a bad side to it. Hmm? Let's see what happens if I do the same thing I did before with the free particle Schrodinger equation. And uh, I'm still dealing, yeah. And 
multiply the equation by its complex conjugate. Let's see what happens. In this case, the continuity equation becomes this equation. So, time derivative of i psi star psi minus psi time derivative of psi star plus the space derivatives minus i psi star psi psi derivatives of psi star equal to zero. And this is a continuity equation again, right? You have a time derivative of something here plus the position derivatives of another quantity equals zero. Right? So if I, again, I can write this in terms of a flux through a surface and then this is, will be the quantity which is conserved in, uh, inside that surface. So we can recognize that the flux, I mean the current, is still the same one we had before. But now, whatever is playing the role of this conserved quantity uh, uh, is, has changed, right? So this is now our, what is playing the, the role of our uh, probability density. This is the conserved quantity. Hmm? This is fine until you Notice what happens if I plug in this solution, right? The solution to the Klein-Gonner equation in row. If I combine those two hmm, and I make these derivatives here, I see that rho is 2e, the energy, as given by this equation, modulus of n square. Hmm. And now, this is a bit problematic, no? because, um, because we know that the energy, if we solve this equation for energy, the energy has both positive and negative solutions. And when the energy is negative, that means that probability density will be negative, right? which is totally impossible to to accept i mean to in, to interpret right if i if i take the probability around a small space where this probability density is negative i will get a probability that is also negative so here i have a no no right i have a problem a serious problem that both energy and probability density can be negative. And this is a sick theory. In fact, uh, apparently, historically, this is the first equation Schrodinger tried as for quantum mechanics. And then he realized these kind of problems and took the non-relativistic limit of it to get to Schrodinger's equation the famous one, uh, and that will, didn't have uh, such problems with interpretation. So it's important to understand what, what is causing this problem here. Right? It's, it's essentially, and this I think Dirac is the one that first noticed this, it's essentially is this second derivative. Right? The, having two derivatives here leads us to a situation where you have to define a conserved quantity, which is changing in time, which is, is itself containing a derivative in time. And this derivative in time makes this energy drop down from the exponential and become, uh, I mean, the rho will be proportional to the energy. And the energy can be negative, that makes rho negative. Uh, so Dirac focused, he focused on, on trying to get 
a version of this equation with only first derivatives, both in time and space. So, he was looking for the following. He needed an equation in which h psi Right, so now we don't have h squared, but only h was equal to some combination of momenta and mass. So alpha and beta were just two uh, coefficients here that we have to determine uh, determine to uh, to make this equation make sense. Right, but but they are not arbitrary. Why? Because he still needed this equation to be true. Why? Because the eigenvalues of uh, H and the eigenvalues of this operator the, that involves the momenta Right? still need to satisfy uh, this relation, right? This relation still needs to be satisfied, otherwise you're breaking relativity. I mean, you want to preserve uh, the relativistic dispersion relation. So he needed to find alpha and beta that allowed him to write this equation that will involve only first derivatives in position and time, huh? at the same time that this was true. Huh? So the condition is set by this demand. This is the condition I can use to find who alpha and beta need to be. So let's do that. Right? So I take h square, right? and, uh, and it's important to say here, the first thing Dirac noticed is that I cannot treat alpha and beta as, as just numbers that commute with each other. Otherwise, it wouldn't be impossible to get here. So let's not do that and assume alpha and beta are not commuting and, 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 and be careful with the ordering. Also, this um, these, uh, scalar product I'll write in the following manner right? with an implied sum over i here. So I'm using I stand convention with whatever index is repeat. I don't have to write the sum. It's, it's summing over that. In this case, I goes from one to three, which are the three uh, space dimensions. Uh, so I'll write this. The first part is the square of this. Uh, I will write it in a particular manner like this. Alpha I, alpha J plus, oops, alpha J plus alpha j, alpha i, p i, p j. So here I'm doing two things, right? Essentially what would appear here is just alpha i, p i times alpha j, p j. But one of the things I can do is take this piece out because the momenta I'm assuming they commute with the alpha and also I know they commute with each, each other, right? The, the commutation relations for momenta is that they commute with each other. Also, I can these these indexes are are just labels, right? I can rename this exchanging i for j, and this is the same as above. So I'm symmetrizing in alpha here, and that's why I have this half over here. Just can, I can just write this as half of the same thing again, but now using j instead of i and i instead of j. And then I can pull the piece out, right? Since they commute, I don't, I don't have to worry I don't have to worry about their ordering and I get to this expression above. Hmm? 
So this is the square of the first part. And the other parts are easier because it's just straight out putting uh, the calculations here. I mean, it's, uh, again, I'm not assuming beta commutes with alpha, otherwise I could put these two together. So this is the cross term between alpha and beta. And the last term is just beta square m square. Mm -hmm. And I want this applied to psi to be the same as this. Mm -hmm. So what are the conditions? First of all, right, this part here needs to be uh, delta ij. Right? Because then I have the term p square. Hmm? I have to make these two indexes the same. This needs to be zero. Because there's no cross term between moment and mass from here. And this needs to be one. Right? So there are a few conditions here. Hmm? In special, this uh, uh, this here is an anti-commutation relation between alpha i and alpha j. Right? In particular, if I make alpha equal uh, i equal to j, I get that alpha i for any i square needs to be one, just like beta. So already I have some conditions here that both alpha square and beta square need to be one. So that's the first condition. And if i is different from j, I get from this part of, uh, uh, of the equation that the anti-commutator of alpha i and alpha j needs to be zero, because then Using these together with these, I have this delta ij. They need to be equal. When they are equal, this is 1. And when they are different, uh, this is 0. And also, from this one, I get that alpha i, all the, for all i, right, alpha 1, alpha 2, or alpha 3, also need to have an anti-commutator with beta that is 0. Mm -hmm. And 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 these are the conditions that these numbers, these these objects, need to satisfy in order to have a Hamiltonian that has only first derivatives and leads to the relativistic dispersion relation. Mm -hmm. So what Dirac realized is that you can find that essentially you. You, what you're setting here is the algebra for these guys, right? And you need to find mathematical objects that are a representation of this algebra, right? implement this algebra. And Dirac realized that matrices can do that. In fact, he exchanged alpha 1, alpha 2, alpha 3, and beta by what are the so-called Dirac matrices, which we'll name gamma 0, gamma 1, gamma 2, and gamma 3, which we organized actually in a 4 vector that we'll call gamma mu. Right? This is the time part of it. Later we'll have to see how the properties of this guy are that I can actually identify it with a 4 vector in in, in I mean, with time and, and space dimensions. So, but the conditions for these guys are that they satisfy what is called the Clifford algebra, which I'm putting here, which, which are essentially the same relations I demanded for alpha and beta, but now with uh, um, factor two, essentially, right? So this. This is just written in terms of the metric, and uh, I am solving a factor half in, 
in the matrices. So, okay, in terms of this, right, if I go back to the definition I use for the Hamiltonian and I substitute alpha for gammas, right, and also I write uh, the Hamiltonian and the momenta in terms of the operators as I defined before, right, so I use uh, this prescription then what do I get? Hmm? I get this equation, hmm? which is the famous Dirac equation, which is the famous Dirac equation. Right? So this was the equation proposed by Dirac to solve uh, the problems we had before. So I want you guys to notice that what I did here was to join the time derivatives with the uh, space derivatives here, that's why I have of this time and space derivative here, del mi, right? and, uh, and uh, well, we wrote something very analogous to the Klein-Gordon equation for a free particle again. Mm -hmm. So let's see if this has actually solved anything, right? This is the main question, right? So now you're exchanging uh, um, an equation that had uh, second derivatives by an equation that has only first derivatives. And what did you gain? Well, the solutions to this equation are now of this form. Again, I have some uh, let's call it normalization for now, it's not exactly a normalization, but again I have an exponential that involves minus i, a product of uh, momenta and position, now I'm writing everything in a relativistic notation, so I have both uh, um, three momenta times three, the position and energy and time here. Right? But now, since these are matrices, right, then it can be shown that these are actually 4 by 4 uh, matrices. This guy is a vector, not a, a vector in, in, in space-time, but it is a, a four-component uh, object, right, which is called a spinner. Right? So this object right here is, has, has four components. Right? which is a spinner, and that describes particles with spin one-half. Right? We'll see why this happens later. Right? In, this, in this approach, which is historically how we got to this, it's not very clear why we got into a spin one-half particles here. Right? Back then, there was this tendency of thinking the universe was make, made only from spin half fermions, and so people were not too much worried by the, by this. But but we'll see that that spin is just not as trivial as it seems, and this is not exactly a coincidence. But this is the solution to the direct equation. This is a particular solution. Now, since we have only first derivatives, if you do the same exercise we did before and write the continuity equation, right? So since gamma square will be one, and uh, you get to a probability density that is again just modulus of psi square, which is fine, 
in, and and now we have let's say well defined probabilities right? they are uh, positive definite right? the energies are still negative right there's still the possibility of having negative energies because you can write this four component object in this way u1 u2 u3 u4 right and this represents a solution with positive energy it's the two components because it's a spin half uh, state right and these represent solutions with negative energy right and you can have combinations superpositions of both hmm? and and so negative energy states are still present but and but people didn't see this as a problem especially Dirac came up with what was called the Dirac C right essentially saying that since these are fermions and you have the Pauli exclusion principle that you could have a universe where all the negative states are filled up so negative energy states would not be a problem right which is a solution for fermions it has its own problems i'm not going into that because as we will see there's other problems to this theory but at some point people were satisfied or at least uh, putting up with this problem uh, using the direct uh, c to 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 uh, I mean, hand wave it away, motivated by the fact that this equation was very successful in predicting uh, uh, energy levels of hydrogen, right? Better than anything before. So people kind of satisfied with that. It's not a solution for bosons, though. We can notice that even if if these guys were, if you find a uh, equivalent equation for bosons then you have a problem because it, it's, there's no point in filling up uh, negative energy levels with bosons i mean you still have a problem but okay but there is an additional problem which is not very obvious from the start let's try to get into that the question i want to answer now is the following suppose i start with a state that is uh, that has a well-defined position so a particle at position x naught and i let it evolve as a free particle so uh, some time after i i have seen the particle at x naught i'm i'll look for this particle again and try to measure its position in a different point in space some after some time after the, the initial state was observed uh, and I want to know what is the probability of finding uh, the particle at this point x given it started in position x naught. We'll calculate that and compare with what we would expect this probability to be by considerations coming from relativity. Right? So let's see what can we uh, learn from that. Right, so essentially what I want to calculate, I'll name this this transition amplitude u of t, right? Which square will give me the probability that given an initial state, which has a well-defined position x naught, evolving as a free particle, I'll substitute with h with the free particle Hamiltonian soon enough what's the transition amplitude for a state localized at another position x right let's see so first things first thing is to actually substitute the hamiltonian Oops. t square root This is meant as an operator, so the square root uh, 
but never mind the square root, while right? the operator is the whole thing. X naught. And in order to calculate that, I will insert, oops, I will insert an identity right here, right, which is just coming from the completeness of the basis of um, momenta eigenstates. given by this. So I'll just plug in this, uh, this identity here. Now why I'm doing that? Because then I know that when this operator acts on these states, I can just remove the head, right? And, and have the following. If I plug in this in there, what I have is the u of t just will equal to. Let's put this integral. Oops. Let's bring this integral outside, and here I'll have just exponential. In which I can remove the operator sign because now I have P here and this operator acting on this eigenstate of the momenta gives me the eigenvalue of momenta and then I have this here. Right? So now that I have just the eigenvalue here I can also remove this exponential outside. Right? And I'm left with x, uh, the bracket of um, uh, x and p, again the, the bracket of p and x naught, which again are exponential. So I can rewrite this as 1 over 2 pi to the cube, integral of d3p, exponential times the exponential of these two exponentials that come one from the bracket of x and p and then another one from p and x naught which just gives me e p x minus x naught right so this this uh, is Simple enough, this is just quantum mechanics. Now, now I want to do this integral, right? Uh, in order to do that, I can uh, rewrite uh, the integral in D3P as the integral on modulus of P squared D modulus of P times 2P sine of theta uh, d theta. Uh, and this 2 pi comes from the integral in the in the third angle, right? In the d del phi, right? D phi. Um, and this guy I can rewrite as e to the i uh, modulus of p, modulus of x minus x naught, cosine of theta, right? which then I will integrate in theta. Hmm? This allows me to do the integral in the modulus, uh, ac actually in in the angle first, right? It's just a integral in this sine of theta d theta with the cosine of theta up here, right? And I can write one over 
2 pi square x minus x naught finally p now p is just the modulus of p so i'm not repeating this notation on stop right dp sine of p x minus x naught exponential of minus e t square root of p square plus m square okay so this is this is just the integral in theta you don't have to believe me you can do it yourself right so now this integral is a little more complicated it's not uh, very obvious but you can look uh, just put it in Mathematica or look in any table of integrals and you find out that this can be right in terms of modify Bessel functions and the answer is 2 pi square x i x t m square so this is the same I'm actually putting uh, let me write here x naught to zero I'm just choosing the origin at x naught okay, to simplify the expression and this is x square minus t square and this is this is what you had before again x is the modulus of x vector and this is the modified Bessel function uh, m square root x square minus t square uh, okay so for instance this is in Grashtein uh, this this integral table there right and I can also look at the limit of this this function when x it must is much bigger than t right? so this behaves in that limit as minus t m square 2 pi square x square which is different from zero this function is not zero you could ask what am I doing here why I are you calculating these things right uh, what's the point uh, and the point is that this function being different than zero in that limit is a problem right it might have gone unnoticed because we're dealing with natural units right so I'm comparing position with time here and in natural units that's fine but suppose I worry about the dimensions of these things and go back to to units where c is not one what i'm doing here is g x bigger in fact much bigger than c t because i need a, f a factor of c here to make these guys of the same dimension right and then you realize that for a particle that started at x not equals zero for it to be in position x bigger than c t then it must have moved faster than the speed of light so I'm going out of the causality uh, uh, a cause of the causal connected region for this particle it cannot be there and the probability I mean this is still the amplitude but it's different than, than zero I'm finding this particle outside its future light cone in fact if we look at the uh, amplitude square I mean the probability it looks like that right going back to natural units so C is 1 this is the light cone you can see that uh, this is not normalized of course this is just that number squared so there are big numbers here you can see it falls quite quickly right exponentially in fact right? this is for mass 1 and time 1 but it's still not zero outside the light cone it should not go beyond this red line right here hmm? 
and that is a problem. This 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 theory is violate in um, causality. Right? So a solution is needed. Right? So first, let us try to understand where the problems are coming from. First of all, when I'm trying to do relativistic, uh, when I'm trying to do relativistic quantum mechanics, I'm doing, I, I, I'm, I'm, I'm trying to build a theory that deals with one particle states, right? So there's a particle that evolves according to the, its wave function. There's a lot of weird stuff. It goes through all paths, uh, but it's still one particle. In quantum mechanics, I start with one particle, I finish this one particle. And we know that because E equals mc squared, if I have enough energy, I can start producing particles. Hmm? So in a relativistic theory, I need some way to do, some way to, to take account of the particle production and annihilation. Right? So that's the first problem, that we should expect this approach with the wave function to fail in the first place. This is a problem even if I have energies which are not big enough to produce pairs of particles. We can see why that happens, right? If, we, if you think of uh, the uncertainty principle of energy and time, which is that delta E, delta T is of order H uh, bar, right? That means that for a very small time, delta T, I can have E plus delta E to be as big as I want, as long as delta T is as small as I want. That means that for very small times, the energy of the system can be above the threshold where I produce pairs of particles. Okay? That also means that E needs to go back to just E in a short time, and these particles need to disappear. These are the so-called uh, virtual particles, and the theory I just built has no way of dealing with that. And these virtual particles actually play a role and and and, um, and I have to take that into account. In fact, this problem is related to the causality problem. Right? Um, people were led step by step towards the idea that the right way to 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 describe these systems was actually in terms of fields, right? And the first step in that direction was the so-called second quantization. So let's take a look at what uh, this um, second quantization is. So essentially, what people realized is that there was something right about these two equations, right? But Interpre interpreting that uh, function psi over there as a one particle wave function was leading to bad, uh, bad theories, right? The interpretation was as this, as a, a wave function which led to a probability density for one particle state was not good and somehow inconsistent with causality. <clears throat> so, what they decided to do was to actually look at these equations as equations for a field. Right? So, Psi now is treated as a field which has an amplitude which is connected to the number of particles uh, in the system. So, that you see there's a conceptual change on what Psi is. Instead of being a wave function of a one particle state, it's now the intensity of this field is connected 
to the somehow we'll see exactly how later is connected somehow to the number of particles uh, present right and then you're looking this really as a classical field and not as a wave function anymore right? but let's go on with it once you treat this as a classical field uh, in a class in a field in a system right psi is actually the generalized coordinate of the system and uh, you can actually construct a conjugate momenta to that generalized coordinate uh, you can you can think this is a discretized system if you divide the space the whole space into small cubes and you assign a value of the field for each cube you have essentially you can you can exchange psi of x and t by psi i of t where i is in the index that goes through all of these cubes and then this is the limit right each of these psi i will be a coordinate and this is the limit where the cubes get really small and the system has infinite number of of generalized coordinates but thinking like that, the classical system has a set of coordinates which is given by the psi of each point right? and it's canonically conjugate uh, momenta, right? Which is given as usual by this. I will define properly what are where is this this is the Lagrangian right so but we'll define all these things properly later in fact being formal this would be the Lagrangian density but we'll get to that for now we're just treating this as a field a classical field will have core uh, will have the the states of a classical field will be specified by this and then, and then quantizing this would be to impose a commutation relations between these. Um, let's leave that out for now. between those coordinates right between the coordinates and their conjugate momenta of course the commutator between the coordinate and itself moment in itself is zero again right? now w what i'm saying here is that i'm turning these fields into operators and of course it, i have to then define states of the field right states of the system in which i can measure the expected value of the field just like i do with uh, position and momenta in quantum mechanics so the observables of my system now would be things like that i'll have to properly define what which are the states and, and we'll do that eventually for now, what we need to understand is what this second condensation really means, because it's, it's, it's a term that is uh, very often um, understood in a wrong way. Hmm? Again, the temporal evolution of the system will be specified by a Hamiltonian, right? But now it's the Hamiltonian uh, for a field. Right, if I take this uh, equation seriously, I can do some reverse engineering and actually get the Hamiltonian, which will get me to this equation. Right? And, and, and then I proceed like I did with quantum mechanics. So that's the approach people took. There are a few important things that happen here and one must take notice. The first one is what happened to the position. Right? Remember that in quantum mechanics we had this 
this um, problem, which I pointed out, problem from the point of view of relativity, right? That, that position was actually an operator, so it wasn't observable, while time was just a parameter that you could change to to so that the film the the the, um, the system evolved in here x was actually downgraded to a parameter two right so the field depends on x and t but neither x nor t are observables anymore in fact it makes very little uh, sense asking about the position or the time of a field the field extends throughout space-time and, and they are not observables anymore. In fact, X and T are both indexes or parameters that you can run over and the field changes accordingly, right? Either the field is an operator or the expected value of the field, right? So, um, and this is better, right? This is something that uh, has more chance of actually becoming a relativistic theory because now space and, and time are becoming equivalent. They're both parameters of my field, right? Uh, we'll see that this new version, this new interpretation for Psi is actually much better and we'll show eventually, it will take some, some lectures to get to that, that this theory now interpreted this way uh, has no problems with negative energies or negative probabilities and it doesn't violate uh, causality. Although we'll have to be careful with the definition of causality now because before we had a particle with a well-defined position at the start and the question we asked about causality is where this particle will be after some time right and we saw that it was outside its light cone so causality violated in this case that doesn't make any sense because the field is already spread all, all over space it makes no sense to ask where the field will be or where it is the field is not really moving, right? So we'll have to come to a, a, a better definition of causality. In this case, we'll get to that in more details, but for now, what you can start thinking is that what really matters is if I know how the field is behavior behaving in a specific point of space-time, I know how, how the, say I measure the field there, can that influence other points of the field? I mean, can I, uh, two points that are disconnected causally, have measurements that depend on each other or influence each other? So that's the kind of question we'll have to ask. We'll have to see how, how independent are different, uh, are, are, are values of the field or, or states of the field that are in distant places, distant points in space-time. Uh, distant means outside each other, uh, light cone. Right. So that's that's the direction we'll go eventually. But I, I I can tell you right now that this theory behaves well in that regard, but takes more careful uh, derivations to actually prove that. Right. So now um, that we know how we proceed, I want to argue that we should be very careful with this second quantization name, right? Well, this thing we're calling second quantization is only second, really, f uh, in terms of history, right? In history, we had the first quantization. Using the first quantization, we derived some equations, and then we quantized something, but we didn't quantize the wave function. That's the main thing to keep in mind. So let's take a, a more careful look in, in, into this, right? So essentially what we did 
was this, right? So we started from classical mechanics, uh, which had as parameters uh, time. The states were set by some coordinates. Here I'm taking a very simple uh, uh, system, which is, has only position and momenta as, as uh, specifying the state, just one position and one momenta. And the observables were these or any any combination that you could build from these two um, functions, right? The dynamics was set by some Hamiltonian, in this case, the relativistic uh, energy, right? And the Hamiltonian equations could be derived from the Hamiltonian to, to get the evolution of both Q and P. You just have to solve these equations and, and you have uh, the dynamics of the system, right? What we did to quantize that was to impose um, commuting relations onto these um, functions, right? Making them into operators. The parameter is still t, but now you have to define states, which uh, will be in some Hilbert space of, and then you have to choose, I mean, there's there's more than one choice. You can choose states that are eigenvalues of these operator, of these, of any other operator, right? And observables will be expected uh, values of, of these operators in, in those states. And we have shown that applying this, this idea to that Hamiltonian, depending on how you do it, right? If you go for first derivatives or you accept second derivatives, you get these equations that fix the dynamics of the wave function for these for these uh, states. But we saw that this has a lot of problems, right? And then we took we we basically throw away all of these, right? Well, what I'm saying when I I'm I treat these guys as a field, I'm not really taking seriously. These guys are not operators anymore. These guys not not a wave function anymore. It's just a field. Right? So I'm starting really from a classical theory here. The first quantization was used as a way to get really to a classical theory for these fields. And then I quantize those fields. So I make those fields into operators. The parameters are now t and x. So this guy is not an operator anymore. And then I, I proceed as normal for quantum mechanics, right? Instead of this is quantum mechanics of fields, which will need a lot of adaptations, I will see. But I have to define the states, observables. Also, the dynamics will come from a Hamiltonian or it's more convenient to go to a Lagrangian formulation, but we'll see all of that. The important thing is that really we only really quantize once this classical uh, theory right here. So the main question is, right? Do we need first quantization at all? Because if we call this a second quantization, it seems to imply that you need to quantize twice to get here, and people get very confused about this, right? So the 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 the, the main question that would remain is: Can we get these equations in any other way? And the answer to that is a big, beautiful yes, right? We'll see that we can get to these equations from first principles, essentially symmetries, right? Most of all the special relativity symmetries. This is the Poincaré group. Right? So, so we'll see that by looking for representations of the Poincaré group, we can get straight to these classical equations. Right? Building a, a field theory, a relativistic field theory for these guys. And then when we quantize, we're really only quantizing once. Right, and 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 that seems better, and 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 more, and 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 it makes more clear, 
really what we're doing, right? Because uh, we already know that fields are the proper uh, degrees of freedom when you're trying to describe systems where the number of particles is not fixed or, or at least it's a big number of particles, right? We have been doing that in many, way before quantum field theory came along. Right? So once you turn on relativity, um, it was almost, of course, everything is obvious once you know the answer, but it, it, it becomes clearer and clearer that field theory was was the way to go. And we'll be quantizing this field. Right? We'll see that you can actually get to these equations in a more, more clear way. And then there are advantages to that. We'll get also to equations. We'll see that this is equation for spin zero particle. We'll see that we can get equations for spin one particles. And we will understand why this one is the equation for spin half particle. Because now we are understanding how these equations are built in terms of representations of uh, the symmetries of uh, relativity, right, of space-time. So that's the first point. Um, let me see if I forgot anything here. I think I think that that's what I wanted to say about second quantization. So just to be definite and, and wrap up the today's uh, lecture, right, this will be the scope of the course. So, um, um, this is basically all the combinations you could build of, of, of field theories, right? You could do classical non-relativistic field theories, you could do quantum non-relativistic field theory. We will not deal with those, although they have applications. Usually you find them in, in solid state, so solid space. People use non-relativistic field theories, both classical and quantum a lot, right? But the first ones to do it was to use quantum field theory, especially, were particle uh, physicists, high energy physicists. And that's when, when you see books or courses on quantum field theory, they usually mean relativistic. The solid state people usually put no relativistic or quantum field theory applied to solid state or whatnot, because Usually when you see quantum field theory, it means relativistic quantum field theory. And that's what we'll attack on this course. So I'll show how to obtain those equations. I'll show how to quantize those those equations. I mean to quantize those fields. And then we'll go through the consequences of the quantization. How to define states, how, to, how are the observables, how to make predictions. Uh, that are observable in experiments using those theories. Now and then, I will review some concepts of relativistic classical field theory when I need them. So this is not a course in classical field theory, which again, I remind uh, you, you should go and look into this if you never saw it. I will review what I need, but there will be a lot of uh, running, right? on this subject. For instance, this, uh, will be obtaining uh, those equations, this part of classical field theory, right? And also these, uh, this discussion I made at, at the start, you can see that in uh, advanced course in quantum mechanics or early in a um, classical field theory course. So uh, that's it for today. I, um, and see you next time. Uh, we finish with some exercises. So th these will be useful, especially for the, the, the students that are taking the course, because we can discuss this when we have a presidential um, meeting later, right? So the first one will be to read Weinberg's chapter one which goes through the whole story of the development of, of, of these ideas that I, uh, that I talked about today. The second one was to go back to uh, this 40 minute mark of the video and show this change of uh, matrices from alpha and beta and to, to the direct matrices. 
And the third one is to consider this integral, right? Which uh, in the development I showed uh, before, I used uh, just use the solution for from uh, integration table book, right? But uh, of course, any any physics, uh, any physicist word uh, it sought is proud of actually solving these things without tables. And there is an approximation you can use here. It's called the saddle pro point approximation. Actually, that's kind of um, um, abuse of language because this is a complex exponential. So it, it is the stationary phase method, but those, those two are, end up among, amounting to the same approximation. So go ahead and try to do that and prove that uh, this transition that violates causality is actually happening and you can see without knowing the exact solution to this integral.